from many different entrants from Dukran, Pema is there, from Endran, Rajan is there, Rajan, you are okay, right? Thank you. From Parn, Pawad, you are there, from Larn, Asita is there, Roshan is also there, but he is not the panelist, but he might help me if I am stuck somewhere. And from Bidiran, Dr. Farooq. So Dr. Farooq will be the panelist. So my role is only doing the moderation. I want to talk less if you not compel me to talk more. So let's start this session. And then business model. So let me start with the services and tariff because business model depends on earning revenue and without tariff we cannot earn any revenue and without services we cannot set any tariff so services that i like to divide into many groups into a small number of groups because there are many services there can be many services. The first one is cash cow service. That is actually generating cash for the end run. So those services, we call it cash cow services or I call it cash cow services. There are some flagship services for each end run. What are the flagship services? How it is defined? Suppose the services which gives you the competitive advantage with other ISPs which are which claim to be our biggest competitor for those who are providing internet services as well so they cannot provide those flagship services like edurome or edugain so we call them as flagship services for we people we have zoom services so that is also our flagship service some of the services, they are widely used, but normally we don't charge them. We don't charge them because we assume or we apprehend that if we charge them, then subscribers might be reluctant to use them. So why we are providing that? We are providing that as a bundle to alert them, to make them more dependent as they become more dependent, as there are no members here, I can speak candidly, as they become more dependent, then probably we can turn them into cash cow services. So this is probably called captive marketing. I don't know that much about marketing, but someone told me that this is captive marketing. You are captivating your members or your customers. Some of the services, we call it out of the way services because these services normally NREN doesn't provide. What are those services? We have a point of demarcation for each and every NREN. They have a point of demarcation that within the campus, we don't normally do anything. But if I speak on behalf of BDRN, then I will say that some of the services like campus networking, we build campus networking for the end for the for our members. Why we do it, that probably Farooq will be able to explain. I don't want to go into the details of what a particular end does. But if needed, I will help Farooq to explain. And there can be many other services which is beyond my knowledge, which is which might be exclusive for each particular engine. So if I want to proceed further, then I must hand over the floor to some of the panelists who can explain for their engine, what are the services they are providing and 
can they group their services in this way or they prefer to do it in some other way actually i don't want to make it a presentation and then question because it makes the session too boring and some of the panelists they also decline to make presentation because it actually ruins their time it takes too much time to make presentation right prema Rajan, you also didn't make any presentation, so it will it might make your life tougher. But who can volunteer to be the first panelist to be on stage to explain what services they do provide? Okay, we didn't first. I opened the floor, so there is no bias towards we didn't. No. Your presentation is here, right? Okay, sir. Let me open your presentation. This one. So, floor is yours. Thank you, honorable moderator. Good morning, everyone. Uh, from uh, BDN, uh, the services on tape. BDN provides more than 30 services. Out of 30 services, we categorize as per moderator suggestion. First one, that is cash cow. Uh, internet connectivity or backup internet services. From these two services, we did earn more than or near about 65% uh, earnings from these uh, two services. So this is, we have called this is a uh, cash cow service, or this is actually brand equity service for BDN. Second one, that is flagship services, already moderator said, uh, Edurum on on-prem Zoom. This is uh, in marketing, we can say it's uh, brand loyalty. And BDN is very much popular in the education sector for providing Zoom services during COVID-19. And widely used services, that is HPC. Some uh, universities or scientists or researchers use HPC. And out of the way, there is campus network BDN provides campus network maintenance and establishment, then consultancy services to the uh, to our member institutes or universities. Okay, thank you, moderator. Yes. Uh, yes I thought you said that the out of the way was the demarcation line, but you're saying you do offer it. So I was confused by the definition of out of the way i thought that that was the demarcation line and not what you actually do we actually do but not normally nren is not supposed to do that i was telling so okay the what very day the very day i joined nren i was bombarded with the message that don't go inside the campus don't go inside the campus you cannot manage if you go inside the campus. But what we found that if we don't go, go inside the campus, we don't have any control over the campus. Well, okay? I, I'm not, I wouldn't say control, but if poor utilization of the campus reflects badly on, on BD Ren and everything else. Right? Yes. So if there isn't if there isn't good campus networking, then NREN networking doesn't actually matter. Yes. Yeah. So there's certain things you need to that is one thing yeah. and also you have to take the discredit so there are challenges also as you are taking the credit yeah. you are equally responsible for taking the discredit so there are there are challenges yeah. for some of the campuses we are building the campuses yeah. actually we are building the campus network yeah. so we are taking the maintenance 
initiative also and we are charging the public universities for the maintenance of the campus network so that gives us a healthy amount of revenue as we are building the campus they are almost uh, it's almost a, becomes a monopoly service that we are there to maintain their campus and as far as internet is concerned our public universities or private universities they are ready to pay any amount so that's why it becomes our cash cow service and so then it's not really out of the way the the campus networking is actually core to everything else you do definitely yeah definitely. and and so that's how you can more easily provide it's kind of perception how you take it okay do you, do you feel pressure from commercial ISPs? You say that I wouldn't necessarily use cash cow, but you've got connectivity as a cash cow service. How do you stay, how do you generate revenue and be price competitive against okay. uh, competitors? That point will come later, but whether we face pressure or not, if I want to explain that, there were pressures, but that has been minimized. And how we have minimized it, that point will come later. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, Asita, could you please define your services or do you group it? in any such way or what is your cash cow services is it same as internet service or? yes i think um we go with the same um i mean our cash cow in the sense it's, it's mainly just providing the internet connectivity and the lo local link charges uh, apart from that uh, the rest is just like the membership fees and and um, some other uh, fees but that's mainly the cash cow is as um, as identified um, uh, providing internet connectivity. Um, and, and, and similarly, you know, flagship services, which we bundle everything and we try to give more, as you said, to get a competitive advantage over others. So it's, 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 it's uh, once again, uh, the same. Um, we, um, we still do not provide uh, comprehensive consultancy services to the, the universities, but that's something that we are actually um, uh, starting to do. Um, and uh, we have uh, we have started it uh, um, uh, uh, in, a, in a more um, focused manner this year. So we are hoping to get that competitive advantage, or as you say, the monopoly as well. Not really to to get the monopoly, but I I, I see the allure in the in, the, in that. Uh, but also uh, the the other reason that you identify um, without uh, having a proper infrastructure in the universities, whatever that we provide uh, is no use uh, for uh, for them. So we to to ensure that our services are um, um, received better and it provides the the intended uh, benefit. So we are. Uh, uh, consciously moving into the consultancy services uh, from this year. Okay, monopoly might be a bad word. <laughs> benevolent monopoly is good. Okay, so yeah, it's yeah. benevolent. Yeah. And what about the flagship services? You have Edurome and um, Zoom services. So yeah, so we we have Zoom, Edurome, Edugain, uh, Federa uh, Federation, IIT, right. and uh, so all those things uh, we are we are providing. Any services like data center centric services um not i mean we are providing some um uh virtual uh, uh you know um, computing uh, as well as uh, services like you know uh, Moodle as a service and so on so we are starting small but uh, that's one of the things that we are looking uh, down the line probably uh, about next year uh, to get into because that's as you have identified once again it's something that's members are demanding and fascinated about so though um, we are definitely uh, looking into moving into that as well why you are not moving it into that line because um, of your manpower shortage um yeah so that i mean we we have identified in the next session we'll talk about that okay uh, right okay. Uh, okay. so uh but I, uh, we were we were 
we were one uh, we were consolidating what we were doing uh, we wanted to consolidate and and build the platform to move on to that one and i think um, we had the idea but with the pandemic and everything we we had to move on to uh, different type of services and change the entire model in the last few years to ensure uh, moving on to the, the online education. So I think our focus changed a little bit over the last two, uh, two three years, and yeah, now we are, we are moving back to what we wanted to do. Okay. Pema, do you want to contribute? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pema from Bhutan, uh, from Dubrin. Uh, since uh, Dugren is a government-sponsored uh, entity, so we don't have much on the revenue generation assets, so we cannot uh, approach it from the business perspective. But uh, in terms of services, uh, we do provide, uh, I might not be able to group in the fashion that you have grouped your services. Normally, you don't charge your customers. Right? So we don't charge except uh, membership for fees. the membership fees, uh, which is very nominal minimum. minimum charge okay i will come to that point right so beside that uh, so for past uh, two years because the government focus was mainly on the schools so we have been collaborating with the minister of education and providing connectivity or the connection to the schools and uh, the remotest of the schools so I'm glad that today uh, we have completed the project successfully and we have been able to connect, including uh, colleges. Now the figure has come up from uh, having something to 1,048. So that uh, the number of agents that we have been able to complete, connect. In 1,048 last schools are now connected. Including the, yeah, the previously connected school, the number has increased to 1048 as i speak today so you have developed optical fiber network up the last mile connectivity yes mile. yes 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 and you are maintaining that connectivity. except for three schools which are off grid so that we are now the plan is we will we are discussing about it so it does another challenge but uh, how many how many people are there in Dukren? to manage the last mile connectivity or uh, is it managed the, by third party? Yes, authority? yes. Uh, the, um, we are very uh, short-handed in terms of uh, HR. It's just four of us. But uh, understanding the challenges. So uh, we partnered this with our ISP okay. because they are spread across and over. So we use uh, them. To, to fix if there's any issues with our last month and where we, where we don't have our reach. By the way, what is the availability? Do you know that? Uh, for now, in, in figure SLA in terms, but uh, not going to the last mile, but uh, in terms of SLA, it's 98 98%. Percent, yes. 2% means 14 hours in a no, month. No, no, more than that. 14 hours in a month. Yeah, it's in a outage is 14 yes, hours. Yes. So, Rajan? Is, is that uptime commensurate? Sorry, sorry, what? Is that uptime level? Because that didn't seem so good, but is that commensurate with other yeah, but, ISPs in the region? Is that power related? Is that is that common for that? And when do those outages happen? Are they, right, you know, right. are they core business or are they brown out? power conditions that might be affecting uh, everyone anyway if it is power it should go yes, to force yes. my dear right yes the power and uh, we don't have uh, it's just one power, power uh, how should put this uh, supplier so there's no question but except for the battery backup and your diesel generator all of those but other than that uh, because we just have one, so there's no two source of power. So that's one single point of failure. And as uh, Thorin mentioned, so that is accounted as a um, force, force major. But mainly the so problem the happens due to fiber cut, right? Fiber cut because of the geographical terrain and the place where we are. So it's uh, quite... Uh, 
Oh, she could put this. Uh, um, special drill monsoons where we have uh, landslides and all that affect okay, and yeah. hampers and even washes away the uh, fiber towers. So that's one challenge that we have. Yeah, I, I don't know the geography of, uh, yeah, of your right. country that's nor right. the layout of your network. So that's my, you know, that's my question. But presumably that would affect other ISPs as well. So they would yes, be yes. under the same. So yes, it's, yes. it's similar to what other providers would offer in the territory. So it's not, it's not necessarily a low number. It just sounds like it for, you know. Yes. Yeah. Even then, 98% is very good if you can maintain it, actually, because once there is an outage and if you have an SLA, you have to maintain it individually for each school. That is difficult. 98% out of 1,000, that is fine. But if you consider each school, maybe one of the school might get out of order for a couple of days, three days, four days. It might need time to restore the fiber. It is very difficult. Rajan, please. Thank you, Dorit. Uh, yeah, so in case of Nepal, uh, it is a little bit different if you compare with the uh, other South Asian and when it's in terms of the modality as well. Uh, usually we are properly self financed so government is just supporting for the policy level uh, and uh, those related areas. And it is fully dependent on the member membership fee. So actually, and the, from another aspect, actually we are a little bit uh, different, uh, or uh, maybe because we don't have any competitors. So actually, we don't provide internet connectivity to our member institutions. So uh, that is somehow we have a very good relationship with the uh, ISPs as well. So we are harnessing uh, that benefits. Uh, so that is. Uh, Somehow, actually, we feel that uh, it is uh, advantageous for us uh, uh, in terms of competing with uh, uh, them. Uh, and we somehow calculate the revenue of uh, after the internet uh, uh, provisions. But I think uh, we found that uh, it is uh, not go with the competition to the ISP, but just harness uh, the competitive benefits from them. and. Uh, and another thing is that actually we provide the secretary services to the Nepal Internet Exchange, so which is uh, the Internet Exchange for all the ISPs. So uh, from that aspects as well, actually, uh, that is a flagship service for you. Uh, is there any other internet exchange in Nepal? Uh, no, 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 only you, only yeah. Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually, Andrew, not Andrew. Actually, Andrew is providing the secretary, secretary services is. for the Nepal Internet Exchange. And regarding, uh, you mentioned the cash cow service, actually, yeah, the, the first and foremost is the membership fee. So, yeah, it is still nominal, but that is uh, helpful to maintain the cost of the link and other related things. And most of our uh, income uh, and expenses that is related to the project. So, we do local and some international projects as well. So, some of the staff are supported from that project's level as well. And uh, another cash cow, like uh, we we do event supports, so that is the part of our expertise. Uh, yeah, obviously, it's a case of other endurance as well, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, besides that, uh, yeah, obviously, the Zoom uh, is uh, uh, as a flagship, and uh, recently it is uh, considered as a cow. Yes, cow as well. Actually, we started to um, providing uh, extra job licenses uh, at the minimal rate to our member institutions and even the other institutions who are not yet members, but they are potential members. And obviously, the EG room that is uh, very helpful for the visibilities of uh, uh, Andrens. And actually, they know about uh, Andrens just uh, thinking that uh, Andrens provides the EG room services. Actually, we need to. Uh, elaborate them that is just a small component of the services that Andron is providing, but our core focus is research and educational data connectivity. Uh, yeah, I think uh, so. You are, your more concerns is the services. I think so far I cover. I think right. So then it's Pan's turn, sir. Please. 
Thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, if I stick to this cash now and the financial model of the fund, which is, this is a government sponsored. So we do not need the universities, public sector universities, they do not need to pay. And everything is coming from the government. But it is done in a, in a different way, like the university, they get their grants from the government, and then they pay to us from the grant. So the services that we provided, that is charged. And uh, here, I think in our case, the, uh, the financial recovery from the universities goes to 95 plus percent. But we have opened it to private universities as well. There are a number of private universities in Pakistan as well, so that is open to them as well, but they have to pay uh, for this. We have a fiber optics in, in Pakistan, that is a ring-based topology. We have three major rings that goes to around 6,000 plus kilometer and the total ring. And uh, it has got pop-up as well, obviously as well, uh, because it's a, it's a, Pakistan is a very long country, which is a, not like a square or a rectangle. So we have these issues. So the industry, you know, the railroad industry, we have cables on one side and another side, so that connects the whole Pakistan. And uh, I think the total UD Rome users now approach into 20,000 plus. That's in two students as well, plus faculty. And the total number of institutions that is connected to fund is 450. And we have this connectivity in more than 70 cities in Pakistan. So that is the overall. This is a huge uh, network. And it is regarded very high in Pakistani academic community. They feel proud to be connected to the fund because the ED Rome actually gave them a lot of uh, facilities and they move around in the country. They don't have an issue. So if they go from Karachi to the other, from south to the north, they do not need to log in again. They can use the same connectivity. On top of that, we are also providing a number of other useful uh, facilities. And one uh, major thing is coming in Pakistan, that is a project done uh, with the support of World Bank. This is, I think, something 150 million plus dollar project. And we are creating two data centers. One is in Karachi. If you know, Karachi is one of the biggest uh, commercial uh, financial city. And then another is in Lahore. That is the second largest city in the uh, in Pakistan. So state of that, two data centers are coming. And both data centers are located inside the engineering universities. We have acquired the land from the engineering universities. One is the NED in Karachi, another is we call University of Engineering and Technology in Lahore. These are 100 years old universities, so we know that they will not be running away from their place. And uh, that we are paying for them. We are paying to them for the data center. The data centers in Karachi is also has got a certification, international certification for its design, and that is container based and scalable. What we have right now, which will be operation, I hope by end of March, the whole thing will be done. Uh, it will be able to host Pakistan data, uh, for storage can be provide provide the storage for Pakistan for the next ten years with the current setup. But we can scale it up, and we think that in the next, next 50 years, Pakistan will not have any issue, especially the academic community. Within those data centers, we are also, also planning to have um, HPC that is coming up. The tender, everything is done, and that high performance computational facilities will also come to the data centers. And all of the industry, and there's another data center already existed in Islamabad, which is the capital, and I hope. Most of you will be visiting in Shalain, I guess. Uh, that data center we can show to you as well. That is located inside the Higher Education Commission, which is like University Grant Commission in Pakistan, which has got the data center, which is, again, the huge data center. is uh, giving a lot of facilities to users. So we have, an, actually, we have three data centers. One is, uh, I know that the two are major data centers. So I think that that will be a flagship for us, <coughs> the data centers. And that will have been cloud-based. We are now planning to bring now one LMS, one e-learning system, and also one CMS. So that is also the tender is already open, and we will be we have tested it with 25 universities, major 25 universities in Pakistan. We have 260 universities in Pakistan right now. This does not include schools, colleges, and some colleges there are community colleges are not included. 
Now we have extended fund connectivity to colleges as well. Like uh, friends from Bhutan was saying that the school, but we have extended to two <coughs> colleges. We, we have now issue with the colleges. We have extended to some of the colleges in different part of the country. And colleges are actually not uh, administratively under the control of higher education commission. They're under the control of higher education commission only by the quality and degrees awarding status, but they are administratively controlled by the local uh, provincial administration administrative setup. If yeah. we keep ourselves limited within the services, okay. then you okay, provide... I'm, I'm coming to that side. So we have provided them, but they, they cannot pay because they are not in our control. So they do not they cannot pay. Their budget is also is looks a little bit higher for, for them. So we are planning to have some kind of now we are coming to a service like uh, we're working on the financial model where we can pay each and every institution based on the student. They will get grants from the government, but that will come to us by through the number of students. Because some of the institutions, they have got more than 50,000 students, but in other places, they have just 500, 1,000 students, especially medical and engineering university. So we think that it will be not um, honest uh charging system if we charging everything a fixed amount so we are coming to the student base that we are thinking about 1500 paisani rupees per month per student and they'll be getting all of these services room with the room and then we have video conferencing state of the art video conferencing and a new addition that we done uh, is the smart classrooms again that is a, a project done by uh, CPEC. Do you charge for those smart No, classrooms? those are things included in this. In the one? Yeah, the one. Okay. So, it's the 100 smart classrooms already uh, implemented. And that is uh, uh, amazing because it is done based on VDI technology. Mm -hmm. So, each terminal in those classrooms that is connected to each other. So, you can speak to 5,000 students at any given time from Islamabad or any other location. So these are some things I want to create. You have Microsoft? Yeah. Uh, Licensing if, if I divide this service model, basically IP and bandwidth is, again, the basic, we call it as a basic character of fun. Uh, model is same for every NRN that we lease the fiber and all that. So cash cow service, we again mark it as a IP service and fiber service is our cash cow service. But Due to the market competitions, uh, the service providers are getting their bandwidth and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, so the consumer tends to attract uh, towards the, uh, the service provider, service provider, the commercial service provider. We do have these flagship services, like we offer the, we signed a contract with the Microsoft to ETA, Activation Transformation Alliance. This is a very huge contract. Uh, to that, we are providing the uh, MS Team licenses, window licenses, uh, and all the activities the, uh, the Microsoft is, is providing. Um, with that, we have a uh, Edurome service. Coming to the Edurome service, the out of the way service that we have been providing by, uh, we, we are providing uh, to the uh, public sector institutions, not the private uh, sector universities. We have deployed 20,000 access points at the uh, university, we call as a smart university, so that they get the access of the Wi-Fi. And that, you're, you're right, that uh, to that access points, they, it become, they, they are used to become the bandwidth hungry now because of the access point, the access they got uh, in blanket all over the universities and institutions. So, uh, and 7,000 uh, cameras for IP surveillance also. Bandwidth should be a blessing for you. Bandwidth should be, yes, uh, bandwidth is, is something that's a blessing for us. But the flagship service like Edurom, MS Teams, uh, training programs are, are the, our flagship services. Uh, YTU services that we are providing some posting services to universities right now, but as Dr. Sub told that, we are we, we we are about to launch our data center. Then we will be having hosting the cloud system and that. Okay, thank you. How it? It's kind of dangerous that someone left a microphone in front of me, uh, and I missed the first meeting that you had. Right. Um, 
But I actually want to know why you use the word emerging regarding these NRANs, because you have the confidence of your government, you seem to have the confidence of your members, you have high degree of connectivity to those members, great service time, uh, an array of services. I think that everyone who's presented so far any country on the planet would be proud to have an NREN uh, as capable as, as those that are talking in this room. And I don't think that emerging is necessarily a good reflection of that. I think you're actually uh, exceptional in what you do and you should not hide your light under a bushel by saying that, you know, you're, you know, maybe you're only starting out and you've still got so much more to go, but you've actually done so much in comparison with many other territories and maybe there actually aren't NRENs in this room that maybe they don't think they can learn from you but they can and so yeah very good question i asked the same question to roshan but who are emerging engines what is the definition of emerging engines so roshan told me that anybody can join emerging engines so that's why we are continuing this session so if Arnett comes, okay, we are emerging, okay, fine, let them come. If Sarnet comes, okay, we are emerging, we want to follow you, so let them come. This floor is wide open. I but think emerging, uh, if you if you missed the last session, uh, multiple aspects, maybe providing services is one aspect, but having financial stability is another aspect, administrative stability is another step. So maybe one and then is good in one thing, one and is good in uh, not in good uh, in the other thing. So that is a thing that emerging and then is means the maturity level. What are their maturity level in all the parameters? So it shows in the last session the uh, NNA, I think, uh, the network need assessment and the Cambodium that uh, has been, uh, I mean, a survey has been done. But so Fawad, yes. to be candy. No other NREN other than those 13 NRENs dare to fill out the, that maturity calculator, their parameters, okay? Then we could compare whether, as Brooke is mentioning, whether their maturity level is higher than our maturity level. I'm going to, I'm not going to contend with them, but it is difficult. Financial stability, no NREN is, no NREN can claim that they are financially self-sustainable, no end. Okay. Even in the Asia Connect meeting, you can see that no end then comes forward with the commitment that they will make additional payments. Rather we do. Those who are branded as emerging end, I'm ready to help the other end because I'm getting help from other end also. NKN is helping me. Okay. So I'm ready to help uh, Cameron or Larnet. I don't want them, I don't want to compel them to pay more. As long as I can sustain, I can help them. And once they will grow up and they will help me. That's the model it should work in a federation as we are working. So I cannot actually uh, refute your statement, but anybody can join. It's an, open platform. Yeah, that would, uh, so one, to, one thing to add to that one, actually, I, the, one of the reasons that why, why we came up with this is uh, uh, with the NNA study that we, like we did and then con, uh, conducted, what we realized is like I mean, in the maturity index, you will see, as you said, you know, people are doing really well, but in different aspects. Um, what we realized is that, um, uh, that uh, everybody's doing in certain aspects, they're doing really well, certain aspects, there are a lot of things that can be improved. And, and one of the things is, uh, even though like, you know, we are a lot of uh, uh, NRENs are doing really well, there's a lot more that can be um, done. Um, so, uh, so this kind of sessions will help for us to, I mean, as, as we are doing now, you know, to understand and learn from each other. Uh, and as, as Tauri said, so also keep, uh, you know, helping everybody to come, I mean, to make it better to everybody. Uh, I think that that was the idea, right? I mean, yes. this this board yes. this was born out of uh, the NNA study the week that we conducted. I learned many things from Parn, as Parn was mentioning that they used to provide or they are providing the investment in the campus and they are 
collecting the money back through installment. So I learned it from Pan. Now I am doing it. They are doing like Microsoft uh, licensing. They are providing. They are also providing Turnitin. So I am trying to learn. I I am yet to learn, but I am trying to learn. Roshan also will discuss with you about the how you could manage Turnitin to go through you. And Navid told me the architecture, but I don't know whether I can do it. Even with the help of my chairman, I don't know whether I can do it. But that's a different aspect. Yes, we learn from each other. That is for sure. So now, if we proceed, uh, the tariff model. So there are different types of tariff model. One is membership model that uh, Ukraine is following. Collect a fixed membership fees. One is connection based model that is charged on bandwidth or capacity. One can be service based model that you use this service like you use Zoom service. So you have to pay against that service. The collaborative funding model that is very interesting. It is mostly followed in the Nordic countries. So I had been there uh, in 2016 and I learned this model from them. And hybrid model, it can be a combination of any of the other. So if we proceed further, then let us discuss about which model, which NREN is following. Then we shall come up with the numbers because the audience, they are more interested with numbers, not with these boring topics. So let's create the prelude, then we will come up with the main content. So what about BDRAN? Can you explain? Thank you, moderator. Uh, tariff model, we for actually hybrid model, membership plus uh, bundle. Some members, they pay their fees for having some free services and some members or institutes, they use including connection, service and membership. We call say that is package or bundle. And for private university, their tariff uh, model is different. How much the uh, internet bandwidth consume, they pay on the basis of uh, their volume. And this that is for private universities, connection based. Connection based, right. But also membership fees uh, yes. are, is there. Yes, there. So but no package, uh, no bundle there for that. So it's again hybrid. Yes, hybrid. Yeah. By our, our definition. Yes. And a resource institute also, uh, that is hybrid, uh, some are connection and uh, membership, and only few of them are only membership. Yes. So to use BDN service, you have to pay some membership fees, yes. although it is nominal. Right? nominal. And tariff policies mixed, uh, that is uh, for public universities, different policy we follow, and private university, we also follow different policy for because private universities or non-government universities, uh, they don't have residential facilities and they use the bandwidth only daytime. And the public university, they have huge number of uh, halls or residential facilities and all day, 24 by seven, they you consume the bandwidth there. So they need huge amount of bandwidth. So we provide them a package or money. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sorry. The microphone should be taken away. Um, I, I, just want to know, front of you. I just want to know, um, are people paying these fees annually and recurring annually or are they doing longer commitments? Because when Arnet started to get into the galleries, libraries, archives and museum spaces, they required those members to sign a nine-year commitment to be able to afford the fibre rollout to those groups. And I know that, I mean, even in, even in Jayant, right, the, the NREN sign up and pay annually with not always that long-term commitment in place. 
And so is that, is that common in the region? And obviously the, the not long-term commitment um, impacts the stability and the long-term viability. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, for public universities, there's a long-term relationship with them, and they are committed to pay BDN. Only uh, government uh, compels them to take the services from BDN. It uh, saves huge money for government. Okay, and we give the give them all types of services. BDN is able to provide them all type of services. So they are committed with BDN for long-term relationship. And um, private universities, non-government non universities also are coming to BDN for having the services, good services, reliable services. You know, the uh, connectivity uh, availability is 99.99 in Dhaka. And out of Dhaka city, it is 99.98. So they are, our membership is payable uh, annually and bandwidth connection service payable quarterly. So it's a uh, generate huge amount for BDN. Thank you. To specifically answer your question, yes, public university, as he has correctly mentioned, they have long-term commitment. We lay fiber up to the public university. My uh, policymakers allow me to do it, to invest on that, because obviously they have long-term commitment. But to lay fiber to the private university, definitely we do it. We check the business case, whether there is any business case. And we believe that if we can give better services, even for uh, a transient period of time, they might go to some other operators, but they will come back. So our policy previously, our policy was not to lay fiber up to the private university, but now our policy is to build the network and this network will be your asset. So we invest, definitely we invest. Sometimes we sign contract with some of the universities, long-term contract, as we do, did for Boranda University in, in a place in Russia that we do it. But normally we don't do it. We want to be there with our service. Asita, about your tariff model. Yeah, so um, we are mainly um, with with the first two with the membership uh, base model. Everybody's paying a membership fee, which is not it's kind of a nominal amount uh, compared to what we get from uh, the bandwidth uh, we are charging for the bandwidth and the, uh, the capacity. Um, uh, now uh, we are also seeing uh, an uh, increase in 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 people coming just for the membership uh, for the for the um, the flag. Um, products that we give, like you know, for especially Zoom. Um, so uh, we are seeing an increase of uh, um, uh, institutes which just want to get the membership to get the Zoom connectivity. Uh, um, so that that uh, is something that is a little bit of a change in the, in the last few years. Uh, but um, our main uh, revenue uh, is from um, from the the bandwidth. Do you charges. charge anything additional for the Zoom service or only no, membership? No, no, no. So only it's, membership fees. Yes, uh, it depends so on um, how many how many accounts will you provide. So that now it like previously we were actually we could provide uh, enough, uh, but in the new uh, the uh, from from last year when we negotiated the new deal and you know uh, paying for it, we are now uh, giving a number of uh, accounts based on uh, the, how uh, the amount the bandwidth that they are paying for. So it's a uh, uh, so if you are getting higher bandwidth uh, okay, and paying for that one, yeah. It's based on bandwidth. Yes. Number of accounts yes. proportional to, to the bandwidth or what they're paying for, basically what they're paying for our services. So Pema, already you have informed that you are following the membership model, right? And Rajan also membership model. Please take the, take the microphone because you are a remote user. Uh, just to add on to what I hear, a membership by definition here, by the models, so it's a combination of uh, the first two. So we do collect membership fees, but uh, the membership fees, uh, it's, I won't say it's a scheme, but uh, it varies depending on the size of the institute or the agency. So it's not a flat 
membership fees something equally from irrespective of their size so it would depend on the size so if of some the members interest. if they don't allow they, they don't ask for the bandwidth you don't give membership right yes yes it's uh, so membership yes. is tagged tagged with bandwidth. it's tagged it's tagged and packed with uh, okay it's kind of bundle the, yes it's bundle kind of okay and for what yeah, uh, our uh, tariff is basically divided into membership fee, connection based fee, and also the service model. Uh, all are mandatory in uh, for the public sector universities and private sector universities. It is further divided into packages P1, P2, or up to P5. Whatever they are following and whatever the bandwidth they are taking basically defines that what package they are following in. But the three uh, things are mandatory. Collaborative funding we are offered, but as a, uh, I mean, uh, as a gratitude that we offer them that if they require any kind of funding for training, fund will be uh, financed, fund, fund will, finance, will finance them uh, for their training and any kind of capacity building and sort of things. Uh, for the colleges, we, def we, we made a, a very basic tariff of only connection based model because they they do not they cannot pay uh, the fee of the uh, other value added services so we call as a customized model for the colleges and they only pay even without being a member they take the they can take the they can take bandwidth service right yeah we have bandwidth service it is not mandatory to become a member to take any of the services the member to be honest we started just a couple years ago and we we are just extending it to the colleges also but colleges are, are still we are not charging the membership fee uh earlier was only the connection based and services model that we we followed membership is only we are taking from the universities right do you now. allow colleges to use the microsoft Office and the Microsoft Turnitin licensing account. and turn it in all those. To be honest, services. colleges do request us, but for uh, for you, them at we the will moment do, you want yeah, to tell us. But, but for at the moment, just uh, example, we are giving as as a one turn it in license like that, one digital library account sort of things. So very very basic thing to the colleges. If they tend to increase, then we we follow the our original tariff model that is applied to the universities. Okay. So the tariff model that Nordic countries followed, that is, you can see the collaborative funding cost is shared by all member countries for Nordonet. And for Denmark, they charge all member institutes 1.54% of their turnover to recover the cost for SUNET, that is Sweden. It is collaborative plus service-based. 58% is charged based on their budget. Government grants 22% and value-added services from value-added services, they earn 20%. So that is the distribution. So the collaborative model is very popular in Nordic countries. Uh, let me skip the policy. The strategy, let me explain the bidder and tariff strategy. Uh, as I have already mentioned that we focus on our cash cow services. And you may think of charging flagship services, but we don't do it. And we keep other services attached to the cash cow or flagship services, and we provide it as a bundle services. And also we provide widely used services, mainly widely used services comes in the form of virtualization and computing. As in the morning, Roshan was asking me, how much do you allow to use 
the computing services to each faculty members. So normally, as far as our capacity limit goes, we allow them to use any amount of code. When there is any shortage, then either we procure or we stop providing the service. But normally it is provided as a bundle to each university. But some of the university, they use less. Some of the university, they use more. We don't create any bar. And we keep out of the way services outside the package and charge them separately. Suppose if we build campus network or if we do campus network maintenance, those services are charged separately. So that is Bidiran's strategy of charging. So I believe that each NREN has its own strategy. Uh, if I open the floor, do you want to say anything about this charging strategy? Any comment? So uh, from my experience, the tariff is very important uh, for the sustainability of uh, the organization. If it is public funded, then it might not be a challenge for the tariff. But if it is a uh, private owned or it is a trust, they have to earn their own money, then it is very important. <clears throat> and understand that, again, the tariff policy is directly related to the services. If you provide good service, then definitely you can ask for the, the then uh, the you can ask for the tariff and whatever you like. For my experience, for example, in Bangladesh, initially the public university was the member of BDN, but they are not uh, supposed to get all the bandwidth from BDN. They are very free to take the services from even from the private organization and ISP service provider. So when we found that BDN services is good enough and they can provide all the, uh, they can meet all the requirements of the universities. The university uh, relied on the BDN and they got all the bandwidth from the BDN. Then they cut down the sub, uh, bandwidth which they getting from the private owner. And in our country, uh, for the public university, public university make an agreement and uh, make a uh, with BDN and contract and depending on the contract, they are getting the money from the government as a grants and they are provided. So, and another thing is there is no single solution and you have to, uh, from case to case, the solution might be the different. If it is uh, in, in a particular country, they have to understand the uh, government attitudes, they have to understand the how the institutions will getting the money it is it might be college the requirement of college and the requirement of university are not the same even the requirements of public university and requirement of the private university are not the same so the things should be case to case you, you have to understand the situations and depending on the situations you will find your model which will be suitable for you and that is uh, i can say this uh, from my experience Thank you. Thank you, sir. There are different cultures, different chemistries. So I don't want to dig down because in our country, uh, there are other issues also. So even if you provide good service, it might happen that the ISP operators will dominate on you and they will get preference. So that's why we need marketing and even with marketing, we have some limitations, but those ISP operators, they don't have any limitations. So I don't want to go into the details, probably you understand, or all those who are there from the emerging and then or from South Asia, they understand the internal chemistry, how it works. So if we proceed to the financing model, now probably the numbers are coming. So this is a graph, how the entrants are being funded. So you can see that for CapEx, for capital expenditure, out of 19 entrants, 13 are government funded. 
three are hybrid and three only are there with client financing. If I want to divide, I want to actually uh, superimpose it with GDP per capita. So you can see that the lower the GDP per capita, it should be government finance. If it is higher, it can be client finance or it can be government finance. Government finance is the safest option to go with. So it doesn't matter how much your per capita GDP is, but if your per capita GDP is lower, it is better to keep government financing. But there are a few exceptions like NREN, LARNET, and LARN. If with client financing and with low GDP per capita, if you are financially stable, then actually I don't mind. You are really doing well. So I will give clap to them. But if with low GDP per capita, you are client finance, and if you are not doing well, if you are not sustainable, then you have something to get worried about. Right, Rajan? You agree. If we go to OPEX, then we will find that number of government financing gets little bit less and client financing gets little bit higher because normally many of the entrants, they are capable of paying at least their copy to OPEX, not CAPEX. For CAPEX, they need to go to the government. Even for BDRM, for CAPEX, for bigger expansion, we need to go to the government. But for smaller expansion, we can do it from our own funding. And we are doing it at the moment, although government fund is coming, but I'm a little bit scared of government funding. I will let you know why I'm scared. So that is the scenario in Asia Pacific region. So you can see. Do you have a version of this graph that shows, like you've got the percentage of funding, but you don't have funding per GDP or uh, per capita or, or actual raw dollar amounts of funding because obviously some people will be funded to varying amounts it might all come from the government but it might be a very small amount from the government is it did did the survey respondents okay. give an idea of how much they received in total and about is there the a... absolute number yeah yeah or well, I have you know to a... check. okay i have to check i collected it from compendium but i have to check i will let you know so this is a thumb rule. I have created it. So uh, you might differ with this, that if you have per capita income below 10,000, it is better to go with government financing. You will remain safe. If it is above 10,000, you can be government finance. You are always safe with government finance. If there is no pressure from government, that you have to be self-sustainable. But I know that even for the entrants in the developed countries, they have also been pressured by their government to become self-sustainable. So for OPEX funding, the limit is a little bit less. If it is below 5,000 US dollars, it is it can be government finance or client finance. It is above 5,000 USD. It can be client finance, but it can be government finance also. So with this, let me start coming up with numbers. What are the revenues and expenses of different engines? I don't know whether everybody will be candid in telling the amount, but as Bidiran's account is publicly audited, and we have our audited statement in our annual report, annual report given. So we have annual report for you. 
how many are, are there? If there is shortage of number, give one report to each end. So we can express it in numbers. Probably one will do it, right? What? I found it in your presentation. Yeah. I'm here to give you the flow. Please wait. So learn will give you a number, right, Asita? Yeah, revenue and expenses. You are ready to give your number, right? Okay, let's start with Bidiran first. And then we shall see how the number goes for other engines. Uh, right now, okay. okay, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, initial model of BDN, uh, two types of uh, we know two types of initial model a depreciation model as per IS International Accounting Standard 16. Depreciation for uh, model is followed by many other uh, and then, and we do follow capital replenishment model that is capital investment may be uh, divided into two parts. You see, replacement capital and capital for expansion of business. We do follow this one. The last initial year. Replacement of capex of uh, BDN. It was uh, zero point four one million, and surplus was you, you see surplus was uh, zero point eighty one million, and yeah. In the previous financial year, operating revenue was 1.75, you see, the non-operating 0.78, in total 2.53, out of this expense was 1.72 million and a surplus was 0.81 million, which was invested for capital replacement in the last financial year. Can I add on? Yes, yes, sir. So actually, there are two types of revenue. One is operating revenue. Operating revenue that comes directly out of the services. Okay, we charge through hybrid model. So we get operating revenue from the universities, research institutes, and also from colleges. And non-operating revenue, actually government gave us a grant as endowment fund a healthy amount of money, I think around at the current exchange rate, it will be 7 million USD. And yeah. we keep it in the bank and it gives us an interest in the form of FDR, we keep it. So that comes as 0 0.78 million. So this is the financial year 2022-23, so which year. has been audited. So we have a total revenue of 2.53 million USD. And against that, we have an expense of 1.72 million. So operating revenue exceeds the annual operating expenses. And the surplus is, now you can go to the previous slide. Okay. Okay. That 
that, that, that. Yes. So now you can see that the surplus is 0 0.81 million. And we use replacement capex. So I don't know whether this model is accepted from accounting perspective, but I use this not to uh, get my board members getting scared. Okay, I want to get them rid of getting scared. Okay. Yes, sir. We, we do follow the accounting international accounting standard IS sixteen. So this is model. This model is accepted by this. Okay, he is an auditor, so he is vetting me. Okay. Actually, the problem is we invested huge amount of money. Government invested huge amount of money around uh, 14, 15 million or more than that, 20 million USD. And the money was spent on procurement of goods, which we could procure at far lower cost. So what happened because of the high cost in procurement, the depreciation is very big. It's a huge amount of depreci depreciation which is being charged. Suppose 400 terabyte storage, I bought it with uh, more than 1.5 million USD. So actually from the project. Few days back, very recently, I bought the same amount of so storage with 0 0.25 million USD. So it's almost one fifth or one sixth. So that's why if we go, if we follow depreciation model, then the depreciation is too high. So I have assured my board that don't get worried. The, although the equipment is getting depreciated, it will not be out of the order or you, I won't ask you to pay an additional amount of 15 to 20 million USD to replace it after five years. Why? Because I am continuously replacing it. So I've already replaced my storage and I have replaced many of the servers. The server capacity probably has been tripled with one third of the amount that was spent under the project. So this model gives a better look to the financial statement it assures the board of trustees. So that's why, and it is more realistic. That is very important. I'm not camouflaging. I'm not maneuvering. It is actually a realistic model, which we are following. Okay. Thank you. Asita, you want to come up? Everybody wants to see the numbers. Okay. Do you want me to share your presentation? Can I, can I share it? You joined in June? Yeah. Yeah, Osita and We can continue in the next session because so um, I mean this is just a summary of our financial status. Um, uh, it's no breakdown there, but. Um, just to, um, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we have all our um, uh, funding is, you know, is, we are basically self-financed. So uh, it's from uh, the revenue uh, that we get from the membership um, and, and other few other things as membership fees and grants and projects and that comes in, but majority is revenue. Um, so the expenses are, um, again, uh, get, getting the, all the, the services as well as the equipment, everything that goes on with it. Um, so it's just a summary. Um, as you can see, uh, what what we are doing um, 
is mainly uh, as you can um, like you know until about 2016 we have been um, I mean we have streamlined and we were getting a, a lot of uh, profit margin bigger profit margin and we have started investing those um, increasingly so um, uh, our revenue has gone up our our expenses have also gone up with that one so just basically um, we've been uh, investing that to provide more and more services so for example even zoom uh, what we are paying for zoom now you know we are absorbing it to, to our um, from uh, through our expenses um, and and we are trying to uh, increasingly provide more and more services uh, to, to while keeping uh, our profits in the margin of between you know 10 to 15 percent just to interrupt with what figure should we divide to get it in dollar uh, so now it's about 300 um, and 25 rupees per dollar uh, US dollar. Uh, so 600 million divided by so 2 million actually your mm -hmm, revenue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. every year uh, well we are a small country and uh, um, Six hundred, yeah, about two million. Yeah, um, so I mean, we are a smaller country, and we have um, uh, we have about uh, fifty nine members at the moment. But it's um, majority, uh, like you know, state universities. You like have what is your total asset value? Okay, yeah. Huh? Infrastructure that. Um, Equipment With two million deliver. investment, you are earning two million revenue per year. You are the man. We we, we, we have we don't have assets because we are buying and selling right? mostly. Uh, it's mostly service based, right? That is good. We should follow your model. Well, maybe we are trying to come to your model, so I don't know like <laughs> what we should I'm, be really doing. I'm, <laughs> I'm investing more than ten million to get a two million dollar uh, revenue. If you if you look at numbers, because you're now talking about numbers, your revenue is about similar numbers, right? Two million, two point five, eight, three, something like three much expenses. We this are a very small country. We are a very small country. Lower number of members, uh, lower number of uh, users, right? So our total number of users is about 250,000 total everything together including all the students 250,000 right so per student our cost is very high uh, particularly we think because we are just buying and selling right so if uh, if we have our own infrastructure it will be much lower uh, that is why we think we should come uh, come to your model right so as of now it's very expensive so is there any plan yeah. So you are looking for financing, right? Yes. So I should channelize some of my financing to you. Ah, please. To give you more burden. <laughs> because finance is a burden for me. Yeah, I know. Okay, Pema? I might not have much information here. So before break, maybe Pakistan could. Okay. okay. Then we can come back. Or Rajan, Pakistan can give the finishing. Always, he's a good finisher. Rajan, okay. please go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks. Sorry. Uh, yeah, in case of uh, Angwin, yeah, actually, we have the budget uh, around 100 k USD. So that is equivalent to uh, 10 million NPR. And, uh, 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 and in terms of investments uh, for the infrastructure, actually, uh, we are with the, um, a lot. Actually, we don't have that, that kind of investment. So in terms of the assets, right? So usually for the data centers and the fiber, last mile connectivity. So that is, uh, we just need the circuits. And uh, for the data center as well, actually, we hosted our network operation centers that is supported by the data centers actually for us. So we don't have to pay. Uh, so uh, what is your total asset in brief? What is your total asset and what is your total revenue? 
uh, I haven't calculated that way, but the total budgets of uh, the last year, uh, if, we, if we think for that part, is like 10 million NPR, so which is 100, uh, 100 USD, uh, 100 K. USD, 100 K. Right. Okay. So that is your revenue, right? Uh, because you are self financed. No, no that, that is not our revenue. Our revenue is around uh, 80 K USD. So rest so, 20k, how do yeah, you manage yeah. that, that? That is actually I added the cost of those services which are which we are getting uh, without uh, direct funding, right? Like the uh, like the, we have I have also included some cost of the our data center hosting charges. We we, we really not pay those uh, uh, services, but that is supported by the data center. So, uh, okay, so you are getting support from some third party. Yeah, actually, it's a partnership with the internet okay. service providers and the internet exchange as well. So we are harnessing uh, those benefits. So if we calculate those things in terms of uh, money, then obviously it will be high. <coughs> but they are, uh, that is the bonus for us. Okay. Thank you. So, Fawad, if I give you the floor, or sir, if I give you the floor after coffee break, will it be a problem? Because it is already 10.30, so I want to give the break. But thank you. So enjoy your coffee, and then we will meet again.